All right, so this is the Wisconsin Lighting Lab Wheelcast, and I have a very special guest with me today. Um, his name is Laurie, and he's with a company called Lettle. Um, Lettle is uh, a leader in the optical design space. Uh, you guys have operations in both Finland and the USA, yep. and uh, really do everything from design to develop to manufacture optical systems for, yep. for LED applications. Um, just to get started, why don't you tell me a little bit about, um, a little more what Lettle mm -hmm. does and then your background in the, the lighting industry. Yeah. So like you said, um, Lettle is pretty much a one-stop shop for LED optics. So we're headquartered in Finland, founded in 2002. Uh, we have about 20 optical designers in Finland. Uh, we have manufacturing capabilities in Europe in several locations, Asia, and nowadays in the States as well. State sites, we do have a sales office here as well in the Chicago area. So that's where I work out of. We have our tech support there, Gonios, stuff like that. So that's more to service the U.S. customers and, you know, help with technical support. Awesome. And, Laura, you, your background, you actually started um, back in Finland on the, on the shop floor, correct? And then you got into, into the sales side and eventually moved yeah. to the U.S. But, yeah, uh, so the, the first thing I did, I was in the lab actually measuring okay. samples. So any products we released, I, I was actually qualifying them, make sure they were according to the spec, doing things like that. So I spent a lot of my time in the, the dark rooms of the Gonios. So, so you know the, the, the nitty-gritty details of, uh, of optics, which yeah, is, which you, is you awesome. Yeah, you say that, yeah. yeah. And now, now your role, I know you, just, you switched roles recently, but um, your title is the technical sales manager for the North American region. But what is, mm -hmm. what is your day-to-day -day entail? Are, are you supporting your regional sales reps, or what, yeah. what does that look like? Yeah, so it's about 50-50. So we have a lot of custom projects in the States, so I manage all of those. That takes maybe half of my time. Um, a lot of times I'm on the road. So I work out of the plane. I work out of the airport, wherever. Um, travel with, with Adam, who's our Midwest guy. Uh, Jeff on the West Coast. Kevin's on the East Coast. And then our uh, key account manager, Paul, down south. So travel with, with them quite a bit. Got it. Yeah, it's funny when I, you know, when I first got into the the lighting side of our, our business, um, you know, one of the things I learned very quickly is that a major part of the, you know, the, the value of a lighting fixture is mm. is the optical design. Right. And, uh, you know, a lighting platform, you know, certainly, um, you know, some of the benefits of one fixture versus the other could be the lumens per watt, could be the quality of the workmanship, the mm -hmm. engineering. But at the end of the day, you know, the fixture is designed to put foot candles on a surface. Could be a vertical right. surface, could be a horizontal surface. Yep. And you know, that's that's all optics. So, mm -hmm. as far as you know, if we talk about optics 101, the different mm -hmm. materials, um, you know, the different you yep. know components of of different platforms. What are the major materials that you guys work with on the optical side? So our main three materials are um, acrylic, which is our highest runner. We also do a little bit of polycarbonate. So, and some countries you might have uh, uh, specifications that actually call out for polycarbonate instead of acrylic. Uh, but then we also do silicone optics as well. So silicone is kind of the best of all worlds, you know best thermally best you know against impact and also optically just as good as acrylic so when, when you think about the kind of the hierarchy of optical materials you would mm -hmm. have um polycarbonate at the bottom more or less and it depends mm -hmm. on the application sure. acrylic would be kind of a mid-grade option and then yeah. silicone would be the high end is that is that correct right if, if you just all things considered you could you could definitely say that so um polycarbonate does have its upside you know impact protection things like that but um it yellows easily so outdoor use probably not the best option so some manufacturers you know for optics they might run high quantities of you know polycarbonate that's why they prefer to do it sure um has a slightly different refractive index to acrylic so they might be more familiar with designing optics around that so that's why they prefer it uh, but just from an efficiency standpoint, you know, acrylic is, is better than polycarbonate um, and it's on par with silicone. But then again, silicone is... It's a little is, more expensive. It's, than, it's, yeah. it's more expensive, but it also has some other upsides. You know, it's easily sealable. Yep. Um, it's pretty much its own self, you know, gasket. So you just need to add a frame to an optic and you can seal it. You know, it's the, out of the three materials, it's the only one that's flexible and yep. elastic. So. And the, the material that we've used traditionally has been, has been a silicone... Um, yep. material and we do use some you know some reflectors on sure. a, in a limited basis but you know, we've had very very good luck the last five years with you know with silicone mm -hmm. um you know it's um i know you know there are at times for some environments that are dusty and dirty you know some people mm -hmm. have concerns with the, the tackiness of silicone but right. you know, we've never had any failures we've had we've had really good yep. luck um and i think you know as as the next wave of our designs um as we get into more you know 
discrete options versus the traditional uh, you know, yeah. COBs, we're going to be looking at acrylic options. Sure. Um, what do you see as, you know, do you see trends in the industry with factories designing and using one material versus the other, or is it really based on application? Um, it's based on application, but also based on the LED source you're going to use. So if you're using mid-power LEDs, 5 cent LEDs, there's no reason at all why you would do silicone over acrylic. Sure. It's just a waste of money, to be honest. Um, so if you're using COBs, you, you have a good reason to use silicone. If you're using smaller LEDs, you're spreading the heat out a little bit more. You can, you're can you totally fine with going with acrylic. Um, so that's it's usually the LED that dictates which material you want to go with. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so taking a, a step back, looking at from a, from a higher level, um, you know, for, for somebody that's new to the industry or new to mm. selling our products or even, you know, something in the engineering team that's not familiar with, with LED engineering, mm. what do optics do? You know, what, what are the fundamental right. reasons behind light fixtures using optics? Right. So, so the, the reason why you would use an optics is you're taking the light out of your LED source and you're putting it where it belongs. So for example, in a street lighting application, you want the light to be on the street and to follow the street. So that's what the optic does. Um, optics can collimate light. So in, if you want to light up a really tall column, uh, you have to reach the top of the column. You want to collimate the light. You want to make a kind of like a pencil beam, go up that beam. Um, so it, it's really guiding the light where it has to be. You know, it doesn't matter how efficient your fixture is. if none of the light hits the ground and is, is not usable light. And if by efficient, you mean lumens per watt. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of, we've got a major focus right now around sports lighting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of our growth, a lot of our development are, is around uh, sports lighting products, which in terms of optics or putting the optical desi design mm -hmm. to the test, there's few sure. applications that test the system more sure. so than that. Yep. Um, you know, what do you see trend-wise, you know, material-wise, kind of design-wise, um, within the, the sports lighting space. If, if you're, if you're mm. a, a sales rep of ours, if you're an engineer, what, you know, what types of topics and things should people be thinking about and pitching to their, their clients? Yeah, I think a glare is a, is a big question uh, in sports lighting nowadays. So um, there's a lot of designs out there that have some kind of shielding um, to block up light, for example. Yep. Um, but if, if you really go down to the design of the fixture, you want to kind of avoid that. If you have an optic that's good enough, you don't need that that you know glare shield. Um, there's different kinds of optical patterns you can do where you can actually angle the fixture down towards the ground a little bit more to cut down the uplight that way. Um, so there's a lot of you know trends in experimenting with with different kinds of beam patterns, mm -hmm. not just straight direct to the field. You know, just forward throw. You know, uh, freeform optics, things like that. So on the sports side, if there's no, you know, we, we have a system right now with our Helios product, we call it the glare killer. Right. So we use a combination of a, a 20 or 30 degree uh, beam angle. And mm -hmm. we also have a, a visor system that redirects spill light. It yep. turns into usable light on the field. Sure. Um, it also blocks, you know, some of the line of sight glare uh, that you can mm -hmm. have. But w what you're saying is, um, you know, a lot of the designs will get rid of reflectors altogether and use yep. directional light. So how do you... How do you manage the the beam path? Because uh, you know mm -hmm. certainly if somebody gets in the in the line of the beam, regardless of the optic, they're still going to have uh, a glare issue. Yeah, there's no way around that, honestly. Yeah. So wh wherever you're putting the light, the light has to go there. It takes a path in there. There's yeah. no you can't make turns with light, right? Yeah. So it goes straight in there. So if you're looking at the light source from that direct angle, then you're going to get glare. So um, really, so really, the goal, um, you know, for for our applications team would be to, you know, really spread out. The light sources as much as possible. Yes. So it, you, you could you could have you know ideally you'd have infinite light sources in all different directions. Yeah, and to, only one of them causes glare. And only one yeah. one individual light source. Yeah, so yep. that that pretty much calls out for like a laser beam. You want as tight of a beam as possible because um, it's going to be harder to get into the path of that light to get into that high intensity zone where you look at the light and you actually uh, get glare. Yep. Gotcha. So beyond optics, I know traditionally with HID lighting and mm. fluorescent lighting, they, you know, they did not use optics. They used reflectors, um, mm. they were diffusers, you know, beyond optics, um, what, what type of, you know, lighting distribution technologies do you see people using? 
So, so we actually usually talk about optics, including reflectors. And so it's within lenses. the same category. Yeah, so Got it. Any any optical system could be a reflector, or it could be a lens. But so some of the examples we have here, you know, uh, there's also different kinds of lenses. So for example, this lens right here is what you would call a Fresnel lens, or some would say Fresnel lens. Um, so this is a low profile design. Um, it's, it has a Fresnel surface, so these are pretty much circles that collect the light and collimate it. Um, what's more common in the LED world is TIR lenses, so this one here, for example. This one? Um, the big one here. Got it. Yeah. So, so if you look at the, the bottom side of this lens, you can see that there's actually a big cone here that collects all of the light. So these are called TIR lenses, which stands for Total Internal Reflection. So that just means all of the light out of the COB will pass through an optical surface, and all of that light is controlled. And if you compare that to a reflector, which you would see a lot in the traditional di designs like with HIDs, is it's totally different to a TIR because a lot of the light just travels straight through, through the air. It doesn't touch an optical surface, so that light is not controlled. So you either have to have a massive reflector or, or you have a lot of spill light. So lenses are lower profile. They control the light better. There's less spill light, less clear. Gotcha, gotcha. And um, let's take a step back and talk a little bit about, about Lettl. Um, mm -hmm. So you guys are, are based out of Finland. Um, I know some of our molds, some of our products come out of uh, Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, is, uh, why, does, you know, why is that part of the world um, kind of you know, experts in in molding and optical design. What other, what other type of products come out of that? Right, right. So, so you obviously know a company called Lego. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, Denmark is, is, they're pretty much experts in, you know, molding for decades and decades. If you look at Legos, you know, the pieces from the 60s, they fit perfectly with the ones made in 2010. Yep. There's, so, a consist you know, there's consistency. There's, there. yeah, yeah, at least some level. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, yeah, that's, that's the reason why you go there. It, it's a premium to going to Asia for sure. But if you have, you know, high precision products like the products that you use, then you want to go go somewhere like that. Gotcha. Yeah. And I know when, when we first started working together uh, a few years ago, um, you, you mentioned the differences between some of the trends in Europe and mm -hmm. some of the trends in, in North America. Right. And, uh, you know, I've talked to other people as well, um, you know, other suppliers and people we collaborate with. And they, they've made comments or they've, they've mentioned how Europe seems to be three to four years ahead of of the U.S. in certain certain product lines, do you think that's that's the case? And what are the the major differences between the two markets? In, in, in some product categories, probably yeah. I mean, they they seem to be maybe they're a little bit more innovative, or you know, they test new things. You know, the it's easier to launch a product in Europe. The you know the regulations are less strict, so they're less strict in Europe. Really? Yeah. Think about UL. Okay. DLC, things like that. I see. So, so there's so different compliance bodies that right. that make it easier for factories to bring products to market. Definitely. Yeah. Got it. Um, so so they release products way faster. They don't. Sometimes they you know test to, test the waters with kind of you know specialty products. You know they're c kind of funky in that sense. And they they're also very uh, focused on the you know the industrial design of a fixture always. Um, maybe a little more than, than here in the States. In the States, it's, you know, if, if it works, don't fix it. That's kind yeah. of the mentality. Uh, but if you do launch something that's kind of uh, great and new, then there's, you know, so much work that goes into it. They test it thoroughly. You know, they in, in the States, people don't like to release half design products. In Europe, they're kind of... So it's, it's more almost like, more of a kind of a laboratory environment where people are, are willing to prototype of. Yeah. test the waters get feedback and then once you have your your higher yeah. volume design right at that at that time it's been it's a tried and true product. yeah what i also see a lot is is in europe um companies tend to do several different kinds of applications so one even a smaller lighting company might do both area lights and down lights in the states it's pretty rare to do that unless you're a big big manufacturer so people seem to specialize more in the u.s within one product yeah. category and that might be just because you know it, europe is a lot of individual smaller countries so there might let's talk about for example finland finland might have 10 lighting manufacturers there's enough space for all of them to do everything um in the states if you have for a given application you always have that couple big guys that really dominate that so gotcha no that's that's a good that's a good comparison i'm sure there's mm -hmm. things that uh 
you know, we can always learn from that market and that market mm-hmm. can, can learn from us. So Definitely. that's, that's yeah. a good perspective. So switching gears. Um, so we're entering a, a pretty rapid product development phase at, mm-hmm. at Wisconsin Lighting Lab. Um, and we, you know, we're collaborating a lot on kind of the next generation of our design. So sure. what I want to do is I want to pick out um, a few different applications and, you know, from your, from your angle, from your perspective, just, you know, really understand, you know, what the most important components of each application are mm-hmm. from an optic standpoint. Uh-huh. Um, you know, within, you know, we, you talked a little bit about street and roadway and we don't do a ton of street and roadway lighting, but, you know, what mm-hmm. do you see as kind of the, the baseline for optics uh, for those types of jobs? If you're an architect, if you're an engineer, mm-hmm. um, if you're a local sales rep and you're trying to get a product specified or you're trying to select a right. product, what are the things that you would look for in a, in a factory or a manufacturer? Um, so for street and roadway for street and roadway, that is a very, very cost sensitive market, obviously. Um, and actually, if you look at a roadway fixture, the wattages are so much lower than on an area light. So people don't really care about the, you know, our, the, uh, industrial design of that fixture necessarily. So they can be pretty simple. It's pure function it's down and dirty. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but optically they still have to perform really well because you, you do need that uniformity and you do need good light levels on the, on the road even more so than on a parking lot is, is more important because people are driving 70 miles an hour, right? And do you see a lot of, you know, type two, type three distributions are common within that space. Do you see yep. a lot of variation between those or do you see a lot of standardization within type two and type three? Is there type two they, short, type three short? Yeah, typically if you're doing okay. a type two or a type three, you would want to be maybe a, a medium, type three medium or type two medium. But it depends on the, you know, where you're installing as well so yep. you know for example florida they actually use type four in a lot of their roadway um set up so i wonder have to do with the you know the distance of the lanes or the amount of lanes yeah the amount of lanes yep. is it staggered is it just on one side of the road um pole height and is is the fixture going to be angled or not you know there's a lot of things that affect and there's a lot of you know uh differences between different areas of the, of the country gotcha one of the one of the product categories I'm I'm really excited about, uh, and we're, we're developing a number of products within this this space right now, is the outdoor architectural and decorative market. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in that space, you know, the, the light pole component is 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 important, and sure. obviously being a light pole manufacturer that gives us a, an edge there. Um, but also aesthetics. Mm-hmm. You know, not only the 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 aesthetics around the optics, but the aesthetics around the the fixture itself. You're having yeah. some of the the coach, you know, coach designs, you know, some of the modern lower profile, mm-hmm. um, you know, aesthetics, um, optically within those spaces, what do you see as important for architectural and decorative outdoor projects? Um, a lot of those products actually, they're, they're not that strict with the beam pattern. So if, if you have to pick between the look of the fixture and the beam pattern, you would probably pick, you know, a better looking fixture with a little less performance. Sure. But, but, you know, the, the end goal is the same. You want to have good, you know, roadway distributions. If you're doing, you know, a walkway, for example, you want to have a good type two. Yeah, a pathway in a park. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of those are type five distributions. So, you know, just, you know, college campuses, things like that. So um, optically, it's not as strict as a roadway fixture. Um, but obviously, whenever you can, you, you try to get a, get a good beam. Um, and I think, you know, I would imagine within those products, um, diffuse lenses are used you know other things to manage glare you know recessed light engines Um, do you have any thoughts on that topic yeah there's a quite a few ways you can actually you know cut down the glare there's some designs where the leds are you know um kind of hidden into the fixture um and then they you know they're angled um they might not even use optics uh but then there's you know fixtures that are a little bit more performance oriented they might have um performance optics but then they you know put a diffuse cover on it just kind of soften the beam and you know so these poles are pretty pretty low to the ground so you, you kind of want to avoid the, the glare if you can cool and then on a, on a similar note the just the general area and sight lighting mm. so you know shoe boxes uh, wall packs um, mm-hmm. area lights I, I would imagine those are a little bit closer to the roadway type applications although I know yep. there is a there is an architectural component Definitely. to that as well so it might yep. be kind of a fusion of the the mm-hmm. outdoor decorative and the roadway space yeah that, that's probably a pretty good comparison so you know people are not that you know concerned about glare if you go to a Walmart parking lot there are glare bombs. But, but, you know, they do a good job providing good light levels on the ground, on the parking lot, good uniformity, uh, and that's what matters. Um, 
but but like you said there's definitely a design component to the look of the fixture when people go from that shoe box to led they definitely expect a sleek looking fixture and and that that looks nice um as well so cool and, and uh how has you know how has optical design changed the the day-to-day -day for lighting applications people at at factories uh, you know with with an hid uh, technology using reflectors i think the the distribution patterns were more limited than with with an led optic um yep. what are you know best practice wise for applications teams either at a lighting agency or at a factory mm. um how do you think that's changed over over time right so so, so for example if you do a parking lot uh, it's a if it's a retrofit project um you know it's pretty easy to match the beam pattern that that whole layout was designed around with hid for example um, so with an LED, it's easy to match that. But if you have a good optic that provides good uniformity, what you can then do is you can lower the wattage, you can lower the power consumption because you, you will have enough light because of the good optics instead of, you know, blasting, uh, you know, lots of watts into the fixture. But then if you're doing a new uh, installation, you can design your layout in a more flexible way. So you can space the poles apart a little, little further. If, if there's good backlight control with the LED optics, you can be closer to uh, buildings, for example. Or potentially even limit glare shields or eliminate them altogether. Exactly. Gotcha. Do you guys do much development around hazardous location products? Not terribly. Okay. Much. And, and optically, and that's that's one of the spaces, I think, over time um, that would, you know, we would probably be a, you know, it, mm. it, it works well with our product line. We do a lot of high output stuff. Sure. Um, we do some... Um, your oil and gas business, typically what they they call outside of the fence. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be explosion proof. doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't, the different class one, div two yeah. right. applications, but you know, best practices with, you know, optically for hazardous location jobs. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, this is just my impression, but I, I think most of those are, you know, simple floodlights. Yeah. Um, so I think they're typically behind glass, I believe as well. Yeah. Yeah. It can yep. be, I, I've, I've definitely seen some designs where it's, you know, a big glass optic in front of a COB, for example, that might be exposed. Um, but yeah, they're, those designs are pretty simple, you know, high, high wattage, people are, I don't think they're concerned about glare or anything like that, or, or the look of the fixture. Yep. So. Cool. So we don't do a lot of business in the space, although in our in our current showroom and studio here, we did design some indoor architectural fixtures from, from scratch. And I know sure. you spend a lot of time on the, the interior architectural products uh, you know, optics play a role. I know diffuse lenses play a role. Mm -hmm. um, what does a typical kind of product architecture look like optically for indoor architectural jobs? Optically, it could look very limited. So, yeah. so historically, especially in North America, uh, because of what people perceive as glare, actually it's called pixelation, where you see the little LED dots. Yep. People are very concerned about that. So they're trying to get rid of that as much as possible that by just diffusing the LED with, you know, a sheet of plastic, for example. Um, but there's no beam controlling that, obviously. Uh, for some applications, it's perfectly fine. Uh, if you're just doing troughers in an office, sure, it's, it's a blob of light, it'll work if you space it correctly. But um, we've kind of, a little, we've, you know, investigated another path to limiting glare. So instead of trying to hide the uh, pixelation of the LED, we're actually hiding the entire LED source behind a baffle, for example. So uh, we're cutting down the uh, beam angle so that there's no light on the high angles, but we also have a baffle system. So there's a lot of products coming out that are rather gonna follow that path rather than, you know, hiding pixelation in the, in the States. That's, it's already happened in Europe for couple of years but it's coming here gotcha cool and then indoor warehousing industrial high bay versus some of the interior stuff mm. uh, i know uh, you know warehousing products and you know some of the industrial products they some use optics some don't you know some mm -hmm. use a diffused lens what do you see you know factories doing from that standpoint uh mostly pretty simple products yep. um there's a you know there is a lot of companies that do use optics there's a a lot that are just fine by hiding the pixelation of the LEDs, but in, uh, as opposed to office lighting, high bay fixtures are higher up. So there, there is a big incentive in using optics. You can use less wattage because you're actually putting more foot candles on the ground. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, in high bay, people are using more optics than in office nowadays. 
Well, on the on the application side, any other thing you want to note? Uh, any applications you guys are excited about? Any any you know, what what spaces do you guys see a lot of development going into? Not not only at Lettle, but you know mm-hmm. with with some of the other uh, trends in the industry. I, I would say office lighting. Office definitely. lighting. Yeah, yeah. So like I said, you know, linear fixtures with you know baffled system instead of you know just hiding the pixelation. That's where the market's headed to. Yeah, it's funny, you know, when I, every time I, I fly in an airplane at night, and I look outside and, you know, mm. it's just a sea of, uh, of high pressure sodium street lights with, you know, some, yeah. L- some LEDs as well. And yeah. I, I always think about that as the Very addressable market, you know, and we're mm-hmm. more of a, as, a, as an outdoor company, but, yeah. and I always remind myself that you can double that market size with, you know, all the stuff in, you know, in, inside. The thing and, you don't see. Yeah. Yep. And then, you know, in, in places like Chicago and some of the larger cities, you think about all of the, all of the troughers. And yeah. all the other interior fixtures in office buildings. Yeah. So it's it, a huge it, space. It's, it's insane. Yeah. And, and, and price wise, you know, uh, you know, from a competitive standpoint, um, you know, it's that's a tough market to compete in just based on the volume. But it, it sounds yeah. like there's ways to differentiate uh, be, between some of the lower the lower cost products. And what what yeah. what what, do, what does that look like? Is it is it all optics? Is it all design? Um, a little I'm of both. Not sure what I want to share necessarily <laughs> in a lot that's of detail fair. That's but, fair. but you know it, it's just got you know pretty much any trough for you see uh that's an led trough for yeah me, um they're they're very similar yeah the only difference is pretty much the price tag on the box or maybe the drivers are a little different but um so people are trying to break out of that you know design style and try something completely new yep that's all i can say <laughs> how much do you think um how much do you think the interior market? I mean, how much has been retrofitted at this point, from from fluorescent That's to to LED? Just kind of a kind of a gut check. Like what uh, what oh. is, is it? Is it forty percent? I hear a lot of mm. yeah, I hear a lot of uh, stats thrown out for the outdoor market. That's about you know right around ten to fifteen percent of existing infrastructure has been upgraded to LED. Yeah. Is is the is the indoor market ahead of that or is it behind? I, I think it's ahead. It's ahead. Okay. When, you, when you're doing like these large street lighting projects, you're retrofitting a whole city at the same time. Mm-hmm. When you're retrofitting troughers, it's isolated doing, by building. Yeah. So or even just, floor. Exactly. It, so it's yeah. a lot easier. Um, so I would say maybe it's at twenty percent. Twenty percent. So still pretty pretty early on. Yeah. Gotcha. This is my gut. So I I don't have any numbers. Yep. So. No, we won't hold you, hold you to it. So you know, LED chip technology, it's really goes hand in hand with mm. with optics. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know we have traditionally used um, what's called a chip on board design. Yeah. And there's benefits. You know, with the COB designs, there's benefits with discrete designs. It, you know, what are, what are the major benefit categories with each each chip type that you guys see? Yeah. So so with the, let's start with the COB. So COB is is pretty much the most powerful and power dense source available right now. So it, it's essentially taking all these LEDs and putting it into a one little package. Um, so this this kind of a device has, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 chips inside. So this is as powerful as this whole board. So, you know, that gives you a lot of design flexibility. You can push in a lot of wattage and a lot of lights into a small space. Um, it's also quite a robust package. So if, if you're not driving it at full current, it can, you know, take some power surges, I think. Um, but optically, it's a little challenging because it's, it's a lot of light from my uh, point source. And it's, 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 you know, comparing discrete LEDs to the size and dimensions of this light source, you need a much bigger optic uh, to control that. So it, it's all about finding that sweet spot. What's the correct size of a COB? You, at one point, what point did you go to discrete LEDs on a on a board? Um, but but for any any high output um, applications, COBs are always going to be probably the most cost effective. Just you know, in terms of you don't have to have a board, you don't have to do a lot of assembly work. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we you know, we do a lot in the fifty thousand to hundred thousand lumen space, and mm-hmm. we've always gravitated toward the COB packages and, right. you know, quite frankly, we've had to, I think, um, 
fight a little bit of some you know misinformation at times from other other companies that you know don't you know they 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 don't always speak highly of COB packages right and you know it, we you know whether it's sports or high mass we've had very very good luck in in that space with those mm-hmm. chips I, you know you mentioned that they're they're more robust and I think that's absolutely the case we've had very mm-hmm. very very limited um, you know, issues with with COBs they seem to yep. be able to handle like you said the power surges better than the discrete chips yep. um, as we as we start to do more development around kind of that 10,000 lumen to 50,000 lumen yep. uh, space, I think we'll, we'll start to use more of the discrete yep. uh, packages, which allows right. for more optical control. That's true. And, and then what, what's also driving it, you want you don't want to do a 15,000 lumen fixture and have one single COB in the middle of it. It kind of looks funny, right? Yeah. So you're trying to spread it out, make it look, you know, a little bit more uniform. So and when you say it looks funny, is it is it just the one light source or is it a uh, is it is there a limit? I know there's a limitation from a beam pattern and distribution type, but you're right. is it is it uh, I know you've mentioned in the past, you know, architects and engineers seem to like a, you know, the, the light source spread out a little bit more evenly. Is, is, yeah. there, is there a term for that? Or you had mentioned is it uh, you know, more or less they want they want a, an even blanket of of light sources versus one concentrated source, right? Uh, yeah, that's okay. correct. So so I mean it, it also comes down to the glare, right? Yeah. So if, if you have let's say this is fifteen thousand lumens in this kind of a size, and then this is the same amount. Yeah. If you spread that fifteen thousand over to a larger area, then looking at it, it's going to be you know sure more absolutely it's going to be less glare. Yep. Okay. That makes good sense. Um, other trends. In the industry, anything that we didn't we didn't cover. What are you What are you seeing out there? What am I seeing out there? In terms of optics, or just in general? Just Just in general, uh, it could be optics, could be products people are getting into. Um, I know you guys are excited about the in- indoor space. Yeah. But uh, what else are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of big moves. You know, companies getting bought. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see in the next couple of years. Uh, do what you the market do, looks like. Do you see a move within the U.S. market toward more specialization? Yeah. You know, kind of doubling down the current model so people specialize yeah, in each category? So. I think yeah. so. Yeah, there, there's a there's only a few companies that can do everything well. There are companies that do that. Um, so people are shifting their focus, I think. Um, trying to specialize. Trying to carve out a niche, right? Yeah, they're trying to find the thing that makes them special within an application. Yeah, definitely. So if you're consulting a, a sales team, an engineering team, um, you know, it could be a marketing team within a, a particular organization, mm. what do you see as some of the most important kind of focal points of each, of each crew? If you, if you were a sales, you know, a, a sales manager um, at a particular company, um, you know, what are the things that you think you know, people that are making buying decisions are, are really focusing on? From a, a, fix, a fixture level standpoint, not necessarily optical level or component level, but you know what uh, what makes the most sense for customers? What are customers after? The total package, honestly, but also I, I think a lot of it that people miss is the support. It, yes, it depends on who you sell to, but you know if you're doing small scale sports jobs, those people don't really know what they need. Yeah, they know what they have had, and they know it's not good enough. So that's that's when a proactive, you know, supporting sales force is going to do a very good job. Um, yeah, and you know, we and that's, you know, that's really what we try to do is have you know, not only the you know, the sales agencies that we sell through and other customers that we work with, um, mm-hmm. you know, not only support their internal, uh, you know, staffs and, and yeah. applications teams, but you know, really provide as much of an open door to our application team as well. And there's a yeah. there's an educational process. You know, once Definitely, people yeah. do five sports jobs, once they do you know, 10 high mass jobs, it, it gets yeah, easier, and, and, but and the, how, you have to kind of front load right. that support early on. Sure. And how often does this person that's going to make the buying decision, how, how often has he done this before? Never, never. never. Yeah. So it, it's, it can be pretty scary for them. So just walk, walk through them with that, you know, with your support staff, and yep. you know, it'll be a lot more comfortable. And that's, you know, that's also what we're really trying to do with these, with these wheel casts. I, you know, mm. one of the, one of the observation I've made over the last few years is, is how, at times, the the technology people in the industry, the people de- mm. design things at the component level, are sometimes pretty far removed from the end markets. Yeah. And you know, there's you know, there's you know, uh, you know, components companies that sell to OEMs that sell to OEMs, and there's mm-hmm. 
There's other people involved locally in the supply chain, um, you know, distributors, contractors, architects, lighting agencies. And, yep. you know, my, my hope is with, you know, some of these will casts is we're you know, interviewing and discussing things with our component vendors. It helps educate really the whole industry and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, our, and the people that are representing our products. And I, I think that, yep. I think, you know, more of that is, is needed. You guys need to get more connected with, you know, people that are, um, you know, making right. specification decisions mm-hmm. and buying decisions. I think yep. that's important. That, that's exactly true. So, I mean, we, when we design an optic, we don't just want to think about the optic. We want to think about first the fixture that it goes into, yep. make sure that the whole thing makes sense. Does this, you know, size make sense? Do, do the beams make sense? Sure. But also the end application where that fixture end up, ends up going into. Does, it, does the beam work for that end application, you know? So uh, we try, whenever we design a product, we try to think about, our customer and then their end customer as well yeah and there's and we've learned you know we've learned a ton from from you guys and we've collaborated on a a number of different optical designs um you know we're currently doing that as well Mm. and it's 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 great to have that kind of push pull where you know we we think we understand you know exactly Mm -hmm. what the the markets want and you guys understand kind of the physics behind it and what can Mm. be accomplished and um you know i think it, it really results in a and a good product and also yeah. also pushing each other yeah yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> it's like what do you mean you can't get a 10 degree bean pab- pattern out of out of this optic just make it happen right yeah, yeah. but uh no that's um that's a lot of fun let me see here so you're a car guy so we'll, we'll have uh we'll switch, yeah. switch topics a little bit so right. you uh so formula one is uh is big in Finland, correct? It, it is big in Finland. Big yeah, in Finland. I, I've and pretty much watched every <laughs> single race since uh, like 1997 or 1998. Uh, missed a few, but yeah. So why do you think so many car guys get into the, the lighting industry? It seems like, is it just? I don't know. You're, you're dealing that with mechanical systems and electrical systems, and should be. Yeah. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> honestly, no, I don't. And you, you won a, you won a contest in Finland for it was a racing simulation yeah, contest. Yeah, kind, kind of like uh, you know, for for a PC game, I used to race that. So I think I was like twelve or fourteen. I did pretty well in like the the Finnish league for that. So how many people were involved? I think it was like dependent, like fifteen to twenty, something like that. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So. So do you need you have a video like, video game system now where you do some racing? Yeah, I, I try to drive it home <laughs> yeah. every, every every now and then. So I have a you know steering wheel and you know pedals and stuff like that. I bought a table for that, but you know nice. I, I have to uh, get a better system for that. So. Cool. Well, what else do you want to go through? Anything else that the lighting world needs to know about? I don't know. I don't know. I, I think that's that's probably the the key things. You know, if you. Th- Think about optics, you know, think about the end application, think about the, think about the fixture designs. There's so many ways you can go. Uh, so, you know, it, it can be very challenging. And really starting with the, starting with the end market mind, the application in mind, and right. you're thinking about the, the entire system, mm-hmm. um, you know, when, when designing the product, you know, versus yep. trying to, you know, retrofit components yeah, into existing platforms is... That's a struggle. So, yeah. you, you know, if you start designing your uh, fixture with a certain amount of watts in mind or a certain amount of lumens in mind, um, that could be challenging. What you really want to do is you want to look at the application that you're designing the fixture for. What are the requirements for that? Uh, what kind of a beam pattern do I want? And then you can, you know, look at this table here. These are kind of the four factors and LEDs that I'm going to play around with. What makes the most sense? Um, instead of designing everything, and then in the end you look at optics, it's it's going to be a struggle. Got to be a holistic approach to, to engineering. Yeah. All right. Well, cool, man. Uh, really enjoyed the discussion. I'm sure we'll have you back yeah. at at some point. But uh, yeah, thanks for partnering with us. All right. Thank All you. All right.